Well, my first exposure exposure to the show was when I spoke to the organiser of the BotCon convention, Glenn Hallett. I'd actually not heard of Beast Wars. It was running in the US, but it hadn't made it over to the UK yet. So I just plainly wasn't aware that Transformers had come back at all. So when Glenn contacted me and said, would I like to come out to a convention and would I like to write a Beast Wars story? My reaction was, what's Beast Wars? So, you know, it, it took me a while to get up to speed on Beast Wars. Glenn sent me a few tapes of episodes, uh, you know, some character stuff. And so it was a real kind of, oh, my God, Transformers is back. And I didn't know. And and it's connected. You know, the arc's going to be in there. There's Generation 1 references. Unicron appeared. It was like, wow, Transformers is back. And I didn't know. And, and you know, so and suddenly I had to write this story. There was a little story for the convention comic that year. Uh, called Tales from the Beast Wars, and the story we came up with was called Ground Zero. And, you know, we had to introduce the convention-exclusive toys into the existing Beast Wars storyline. So we had this little story where these characters, Pac Pac Rat and Fractal, have some interaction with the TV cast, which meant, of course, I had to get to know the TV cast and what the general situation was. So, you know, yeah, it was a bit of a crash course in Beast Wars. (laughs) Well, I met Larry and Bob at that first uh, BotCon convention that I attended in 1997. And, uh, you know, we got on really well. I mean, they knew my stuff. Uh, Larry had used some elements of my Generation 2 stuff. Uh, He'd taken the Swarm, this sort of big threat, and turned it into the alien race, the Vok. It was sort of an evolved version. So he'd read my stuff. I think both he and Bob had read chunks of my Generation 1 stuff. So they knew who I was, and I, you know, pretty much just through being introduced by Glenn, knew who they were. So we just got talking about Transformers generally. And though nothing much was decided at that convention, you know, I think the seeds were sown of my involvement in the Beast Wars TV series. And okay, we went our separate ways. And then a few months later, I got a call from Bob Forward, really out of the blue, just to say, you know, Larry and I have been talking and we think it'd be very cool. I think the the fans would love it if you wrote an episode. And if that episode had some very G1 original series centric elements to it. And so, you know, that was how it all sort of kicked off, really. And by the time the next year's BotCon convention rolled around in Anaheim, we were talking actual sort of story ideas and, you know, running through what we could or couldn't do within the budget, within the sort of series context. And, you know, we sat down at Anaheim and and threw ideas around. You know, this is where we talked about the idea of bringing back some Decepticon jets who hadn't featured in the original animation series and we figured could have been in cold storage aboard their ship still. Uh, We also talked about having kind of Beast Wars Megatron more or less battling G1 Megatron in his head and kind of have him haunted by Generation 1 Megatron. And, you know, these ideas went round and round and I went back to the UK and this evolved further and further, just sort of over many phone calls. I mean, I'd always been impressed with the animation, the mainframe animation. I mean, I, it was one of the things that really made me sit up and take notice of the TV show. I think if it had been cell animation, I may not have been as wowed by it, but the CG animation I thought was fantastic. And of course they'd you know, it had lots of time to refine and perfect by the time we got to Nemesis. And I thought the animation was amazing. I mean, for a start, you know, water is notoriously difficult to do in CG animation. And, you know, I thought the scenes on whatever budget they had where the Nemesis rises up out of the ocean and the underwater scenes in part one were brilliantly done. And yeah, I think, you know, I thought the animation was spot on throughout. Everything from that you know, really sort of nice opening scene where the sort of the bug crawls through the drop of water, you know, really nice angles. And then you get the whole sort of it pulls right back for the scale of Nemesis and it's blowing sort of hell out of everything. I just thought it was fantastic. And yeah, I mean, I have absolutely nothing but praise for the animation in Nemesis. Well, I'd I'd got to really like Beast Wars. You know, the first sort of crash course was a bit like, all I have to do is bring myself up to speed on this. But in the intervening time, I'd seen a lot more of the show. I'd seen Bob Forward's Agenda three-parter, which I just thought was 
cracking television. Forget Transformers. I thought it was great sci-fi, brilliantly paced and staged episode. And by that point, I was really into the series. I loved the characters. I loved the humour they put into it. I loved the the sort of through story arcs that they were developing over the course of the three seasons. You know, things that they'd set up in series one were paying off in series two and three and building and building. And I love that. I, you know, that's my preferred way of storytelling. So I'd kind of got into the whole thing by then. And the idea that I would actually be contributing to this was just a knockout. I mean, at this point, we didn't know that it would be the last episode of season three. And we didn't know that season three would be the last series. So we were just at this point thinking this is going to be a, an episode. This is going to be a, a little fun episode with G1 roots and the fans are going to love it. But, you know, it was great to be a part of it. And it was also my first bit of TV animation. I'd never written for TV animation before. So it was a learning curve for me as well. And I had to learn pretty fast. And what what was very complimentary from Bob was that my first draft script, he couldn't believe it was the first one I'd done. You know, so really, you know, he gave me some good advice. He said, you know, it's kind of like a comic script, except that you can't have characters just sat around. You know, you've got to do all your exposition and storytelling on the go. So, you know, once I had that kind of rule of thumb, it was pretty easy to take my comics work and turn it into TV animation. But it was also daunting, you know, sort of. And as it became apparent, it was going to be a kind of crucial episode defining bit of season three and then the defining bit of the whole series it was like oh whoa <laughs> well i mean at first it was just this was going to be an episode somewhere in season three then we knew that at least this was going to be the final two-parter the end of season three but really i'd done a first draft of the script before it started sort of filtering through that this was also going to be the end of beast wars so, you know, the script had to be revised, scenes had to be dropped, new scenes had to be brought in. And then even at that stage, it went back to Bob and Larry and the producers. And, you know, I, it probably went through about another sort of three or four drafts before, you know, and, you know, some of those were just sort of script editor drafts. You know, I was out of the loop at that point and happy to be because really they were tying up things that were their plot elements rather than mine. So it made sense for them just to sort of drop those scenes in. Uh, yeah, I mean, I really liked Rat Trap. I thought Rat Trap was a great character, you know, this sort of perpetually sort of peed off character who just, you know, is rude and ungrateful and everything else and I thought he was a good character I didn't get to do as much with Rat Trap as I would have liked because we had a fairly packed episode by that point but you know I mean I would like to also have done more with Megatron than I got to do you know it's fairly you know Megatron is shooting things and and fighting with Optimal Prime, Optimus Primal but so it wasn't really you know what I wanted to do with Megatron either I thought he was great and I loved David Kaye's voiceover of Megatron just the sort of, you know, his little yeses and, you know, sort of excellence and, fan you know, I just thought were fantastic. And I'd love to have done a more Megatron-centric episode that wasn't this big kind of cataclysmic conclusion to everything. Yeah, I mean, I found, I found TV animation to be quite a different discipline to writing comics. With comics, you have a great deal of control in the end product. Largely, what you write in the script is what ends up on the comic page. And any rewrites you do tend to be your rewrites. You'll see the art, you'll think, well, I could maybe change the dialogue there and there to make it work better. So really, you've got so much control over what ends up on the page. With TV animation work, you have to kind of take a back seat, shelve your ego, and just assume that at some point, people are going to change big chunks of it, possibly. You know, because it's it's very much, it goes through several stages, script editors, producers, directors. In the case of a licensed product, it goes through the, the licensor, you know, the guys who own the toy line or the, the product itself. So you have to take a sit back and just know that it's going to change. And, you know, sometimes you're pleasantly surprised. You see the episode and you think, well, hey, they kept a whole load of my stuff. When I worked on Dan Dare in particular... That was a real great experience. Lots of my staff made it straight through to the final draft. 
and you know watching the episodes i thought well hey that really is my staff but with other things like when i worked on x-men evolution that went through so many levels of people wanting their input that by the time you got to the screen bits of it were yours but not much else so you do have to kind of let it go a bit with tv animation but i love it i mean i you know it's something i want to do more and more of because it feels you know i love my comics work but i definitely want to pursue other writing avenues and tv animation seems to fit with me <laughs> Well, I mean, I didn't, but I then I didn't know used to know much about those. Really, my only exposure to those series has come recently with the comic for IDW. We had to start looking into those series just because we needed certain new characters. We'd largely taken all the characters that were US toys and dumped them into the, the sort of prehistoric Earth situation. So when we flashed back to Cybertron, we needed other characters there. So... I was helped considerably by ben, a guy called Ben Yee, who's also he's the webmaster of a site called BeastWarsTransformers.com, and he's also um, the original script consultant on the animated series. Um, now, Ben was great. I mean, I've met Ben at various conventions, and we've become good friends. So I sort of used Ben as my slightly unofficial script consultant when it came to, well, what characters could we use? Who could we use here? And and he was great at saying, well, we can use this character from Beast Wars Neo, this character from Beast Wars the Second, And that sort of evolved again as we started to do a Beast Wars profile series. And Hasbro and IDW definitely wanted that to encompass all the series. So Ben and I, who were co-writing this Profiles book, sat down and tried to rationalise how it could work, you know, with all the series in one. So we literally came up with a kind of chronology for everything and where Beast Wars 2 fits, where Neo fits, and how that all feeds into the sort of Beast Wars mainframe series. Um, I found IDW a very sort of good solid company to work for i mean you know they're very passionate about the product they're really open to new ideas which is great you know when i when i when they approached me to do the sort of generation one book for them i didn't really didn't want to sort of re just rehash the generation one stuff i'd done before you know i've done generation one several times and i was starting to feel that i was treading over you know re just retreading old ground but they were, you know, they were keen on the idea of a complete restart, and that sort of really interested me. So they're very, you know, open to kind of, you know, in some cases like with Beast Wars, going with the continuity, but with infiltration and escalation, going outside of the continuity and starting our own one from scratch and bringing, making everything a little more contemporary, a little more conspiracy theory laden rather than the full on just giant robots fighting on Earth. And they've let me do infiltration and escalation at a sort of evolving pace, which has been, you know, very refreshing. Well, I wanted uh, the Beast Wars series to do two things. One, to fit in with the TV series and not to clash with that. You know, that was all established. And I thought the Beast Wars TV series was a great self-contained complete arc and I didn't want to mess with that I didn't want to say well actually that didn't happen this is the way it happened or anything like that so any comic series I did I decided either had to be set after they leave on the Autobot shuttle and go back through the transwarp portal or it had to work somehow in with the TV show so I hit on this idea for the comic that all the new characters who are introduced and who travel back from Cybertron or are, are reawoken on Earth are, are slightly displaced from the action that's going on in the TV series. So though we see the TV show characters and the action sometimes intersect, largely the two stories are just running parallel to each other without any kind of clash. So, you know, largely the TV cast doesn't know that the comic cast is there and the comic cast know, but they don't want to tamper with that. So apart from one little scene where comic villain Magmatron actively takes out TV show Megatron, you know, the two don't really cross over at all. I mean, I'd like if the TV series were still running, I'd definitely like to introduce the characters 
the key characters that I introduced in the comic book, which were Magmatron as the bad guy and Razor Beast as the good guy. You know, again, they were little known or little used characters outside of the Japanese, well, in Magmatron's case, outside of the Japanese TV show. And in Razor Beast, he was only just a toy, really. He'd never been in TV shows or comics. So they were kind of those characters I could overwrite with what I wanted them to be or what I thought would be you know, interesting for people to read and see. So I kind of, like I've done with characters in the past, like Bludgeon and Thunderwing, slightly made them my own and slightly sort of um, given them a makeover in my style. <laughs> I'd certainly like, you know, particularly with Waspinator. I think Waspinator turns up back in Beast Machines, but we really don't know how he gets back there or what his sort of story is after the the sort of the Primitive's village where we last see him. So, yeah, I'd definitely like to resolve the Waspinator thing. And there's definitely other characters that we're never quite sure whether they're completely wiped out in the TV show or perhaps they could come back. Certainly there's characters who, in the toys, got upgraded into transmetals, but never did in the TV show. And, you know, when talking with Ben Yee, we decided definitely you could bring some of those back and say, well, when they fell into the lava, actually they were just sort of knocked out for a while, and when they come back, they're transmetals, and so forth. So, yeah, definitely I'd like to introduce more of the TV show characters who kind of got left behind. <laughs> I think it's definitely with the second series of the comic, although nothing's really been set in stone with this. Two things I think. I think one is that it will have to be set after the end of the Beast Wars TV series. I don't want to keep going with this sort of chronal phase idea where they're slightly out of sync with one another. It worked for one series, but I think it could get old really quickly in two. So I think probably Optimus Primal and the others will have gone back to Cybertron by the time we kick off with the new series and what I do, do want to do having sort of worked on the Beast Wars Profiles book and come up to scratch on Beast Wars Neo and Beast Wars the Second is maybe tie in a few plot threads from those series into whatever I do in the ongoing set on earth featuring Razor Beast and and the other characters like Ravage that are now kicking around on prehistoric earth so I want to take some of the elements you know, from those early Japanese series or the early Japanese series and make them have impact on what I do in the next series on Prehistoric Earth. Um, when I'm scripting these days, I tend to prefer full script. I don't... I mean, I, much as I kind of enjoyed the Marvel-style plot method when I used that, I, A, I don't think a lot of people use it these days, and B... I don't like the sort of slight lack of control you have over it. I mean, I'd, I definitely prefer to work full script. I mean, I'm happy for the artist always to come back with suggestions, to change things around if it works better visually one way or the other. And normally what happens is I'll see the artwork at pencil stage and just take my dialogue that I've written into the script and just t extract it from the script and rework it to make sure it fits you know, as best as it possible can with the artwork. So, you know, if the artist has added in a scene even or added an extra panel, you know, I'll just sort of restructure the dialogue to fit. My two artists, really, I've worked with are EJ Sue on Infiltration and Escalation and Don, Figure Don Figueroa on Beast Wars. I mean, Don I know from from before on the Dreamwave stuff and, and Don and I, you know, sort of I think we're fairly on the same wavelength. I know what he likes to draw and, you know, sort of he's he pretty much knows how to work with my scripts. So Beast Wars has been a, a fairly sort of easy experience. And actually so has Infiltration, but I'd never worked with EJ before. Mm. So I think it's taken him a while to get sort of used to my way of storytelling and but, you know, it, I've noticed with EJ that, you know, from a very good start, his stuff is just getting better and better and, and you know, more confident and his layouts are really good. I mean, you know, much as I love Don's artwork, I actually think EJ's storytelling is, is potentially better. You know, his stuff is very clear, very logical. And, you know, you can really sort of see the progression and the story and the storytelling in his work. And, you know, sort of he doesn't have, say, the flair of Don. 
but he certainly has a great sort of straightforward storytelling style, which is really suiting infiltration and escalation. So, you know, although I've, I've still not met EJ, you know, sort of the little c communication we have by email and so forth and occasionally by phone, you know, we just seem to be, you know, clicking now in the same groove. <laughs> Yeah, it's great. I mean, it's always great to have something that you've semi-created as much as you can within the Transformers universe and have somebody else think, yeah, that's a good idea or that's a cool idea and, and we're going to sort of take it on into something else. So, yeah, it was great to see the, the statuette of War Within Prime and, you know, I made sure I snagged one of those because it just looks very cool and, and they caught Don's sort of design really well, I thought. And, yeah, you know, it's nice that Primus you know, slowly but surely seems to have sort of filtered through everywhere in the Transformers sort of mythos now and Hasbro are very much on board with it, you know, and it, it seems to be sort of fairly established now, which is great because it was always sort of just a comic continuity, but now it seems to be getting out there and it's great to see it sort of being embraced. <laughs> uh, IDW, I'm, I'm working on a few things at at the moment you know the ongoing infilt infiltration escalation new series of beast wars for hopefully for the end of the year and you know the other thing i'm doing for them at the moment is a series of one shots which are very you know which tie in with infiltration escalation and stormbringer which is also upcoming this summer and um you know and in addition to that we've got the one shots all of which are going to tie into this whole sort of generation one idw verse we're building and all of which kind of lay the seeds for future stories. You know, there's going to be, you know, we're going to sort of focus on characters, but each one has a sort of backstory going on that will be explored later in the ongoing. So it's very much a chance to kind of set up a lot of stuff, introduce mysteries, intrigue people, you know, broaden out the Transformers universe and say, you know, this isn't just Earth, you know, sort of Stormbringer takes us to Cybertron and a couple of other places. And these one shots are very much, here's, here's another fa facet to the story that we're hinting at here, but you know is going to sort of pay off in the ongoing. So, you know, we've got characters like Shockwave and Nightbeat and Hot Rod, but behind each of these is a sort of backstory that we're going to get back to and, you know, we'll set up things that will pay off later. So that's kind of fun as well. Mm, sounds great. And, you know, it's nice, you know, one of the criticisms, I guess, or one of the things the fans are struggling to warm to with Infiltration is the pacing of it, which is very much, you know, evolving as, as the pace. You know, it's not forcing the pace. It's not bringing a whole lot of characters straight in. It's not opening things up very quickly. It's gradually building and building. But with these one-shots, they have a whole lot of story in in 22 pages and i think the fans are going to appreciate that you know there's going to be a lot more to read a lot more sort of you know substance to the actual single issues whereas infiltration escalation it's very much you know you can see that it's going to be a, a meaty trade paperback but sometimes in single issues they can be quite fast reads <laughs> It was great. I mean, I enjoyed working, you know, and, it, you know, I hadn't worked for Marvel for 10 years and Marvel really is my sort of spiritual home in terms of comics. You know, it's what I grew up reading. I, I loved all that Stan Lee stuff from the 60s and, the you know, I started reading kind of, you know, when X-Men was being written by Chris Claremont and was at its height and John Byrne was then on Fantastic Four. It was just a great time to be reading comics and you had Frank Miller's Daredevil. So, you know, Marvel has all... I've always known the Marvel characters better than I've known the DC characters. So, yeah, it was kind of like coming home a bit. And the strange thing was I got the sort of the, the writing gig on Amazing Fantasy doing Death's Head, which was wonderful. And, you know, being Death's Head as well, a chance to do it even though it was kind of a new character. It was great to sort of, you know, great death's head again that feels like mine as well but it was like sort of you know london buses nothing for ages and then two come at once so in addition to amazing fantasy i also picked up the writing gig on ronan part of their big annihilation crossover completely independent of the two jobs it just so happened that pretty much at the same time two editors talked to me about two different projects so yeah it was great i really enjoyed doing death's head i really enjoyed doing ronan and, you know, I really hope that I can kind of build on that and there'll be more Marvel work. Uh, 
I always try and make my characters, when they're my characters, actually even when they're, you know, sort of licensed characters, I always try and put a bit of me into them, you know. I mean, it's it, with Transformers where they haven't been used very much, like, say, I don't know, Nightbeat, I could kind of impose on him just because he was supposed to be this investigative, curious character. I could kind of impose on him my sort of love of sort of pulp mystery and things like that. So I, I can kind of do that even more when it's a character that I've either created or, you know, I'm creating from the ground up. So with Death's Head, you know, once I saw the original visual for the very original Death's Head from Jeff Senior, I just thought, no, no, this has got to be more than just a throwaway character, at which point I started to give him the mannerisms and the quirks and everything else. Uh, so, you know, sort of with the new Death's Head, I was keen to also sort of give him a kind of different stamp as well, but maybe, you know, just in a kind of, you know, hinting way, tie it into the original as well. And if you look at the very final page of... Death's Head 3.0 in Amazing Fantasy, you'll see a kind of visual tie-in to Death's Head, the, the original Death's Head. Um, I have to confess that I don't actually read a lot of comics at the moment. I do tend to pick up the odd trade of things. I mean, Planetary I would happily read in single issues, but again, I find it a more rewarding experience to wait for the trade, you know, also because they tend to take a lot of time to come out between issues. So, uh, but Planetary, I think, is just a great comic book, and I love, you know, and, and it really does hold together well in collected editions. So, you know, I read Planetary still. I keep abreast of what's happening on other things, but I have to say I don't read a lot of current stuff, and my buying habits tend to be picking up the colour hardback Marvel Masterworks, you know, which are sort of repackaging all the stuff I used to read as a kid. And, you know, it's just fantastic to read that again. Corny and creaky, though some of it is. It's just fabulous. Uh, the animated movie, to me, was where Transformers kind of changed from being just a sort of licensed product and a job to being something more interesting, more something I could put my own stamp on. The movie, I mean, A, the movie I thought was fantastic, you know, brilliant animation, great breadth of story, you know, it felt epic, it felt, you know, sort of changing the status quo, characters died, things changed, and I just thought, well, this is brilliant. And the fact that there was this whole future cast that the American series, American comic series, really wasn't using, it meant that we could kind of take those characters, run them in different directions, and not impact on the American series, which the British series was reprinting at the time. You know, we had to be careful to tie the British stories in and not kill off characters, say, that were going to resurface in the American series. But with the movie cast, pretty much we could do what we wanted. And I think that's when it started to sort of get, you know, I started to get that epic feel to Transformers and my writing in general. You know, Target 2006, which people still say is, you know, they think is one of my best stories and I still think holds up well today, you know, it was kind of just that, hey, we can do anything. We can go anywhere. We can make this big. We can make it earth shattering. And, you know, and it just went from there, really. And, and yeah, it just sort of changed my whole approach to Transformers. <laughs> I mean, there's lots of good stuff. Don't get me wrong with the G1 cartoon series. You know, I love it. But, you know, when I was writing the original comic, you know, I was I was seeing those as a 20-something-year-old. And to me, they seemed, you know, sort of, as most Saturday morning shows were, pitched kind of young. And, and, you know, the stories were fairly simplistic. Sometimes they had huge logic flaws in them and, and things that really just didn't work and they had mistakes in them. And so, you know, I saw them from a different perspective than I think from the sort of generation that was buying the toys and watching them as kids. So, you know, I, I tended to shuffle them aside and, and focus very much on doing the comics in a slightly more sort of, I don't know, I suppose slightly older approach. But with hindsight, I've gone back and looked at the cartoon show and there are just sort of some great episodes in there and some fun episodes. And, you know, and as as sort of it sort of got its feet, I thought series two had some really great episodes. You know, I was always slightly 
averse to the episodes that looked into the sort of backstory of the Transformers in the TV show because it flew in the face of what I was trying to do in the comics. And to sort of to to look at those too much, it might I might have thought, well, hang on, am I doing it all wrong over here? But now I can look at those in a kind of liberated way and just say, no, they were really fun. And, you know, I love the sort of ones where they delve back and, and you know, sort of they travel back in time and you start to see, the, you know, the original Alpha Trion, the, you know, the original Optimus Prime. And, and I you know, I, you can kind of appreciate how they were building much more sort of backstory and mythos of their own into the TV show at the time. <laughs> Uh, I'm not, no. Uh, that's quite fittingly going to be written by Bob Budiansky, um, which I think is great. And it's great to see Bob writing Transformers again. And I think this is a really cool idea, doing a, a sort of modern day, because with Don, Figure draw, Don Figueroa drawing it, it's going to look like a modern sort of Transformers product, which is fantastic. And yet, you know, sort of, you've got the tie to the old with Bob, you know, sort of, but also him writing for Don in a kind of new style, and I think it's just going to sort of be the movie comic everybody would have wanted originally, and then some. The new movie, um, I haven't really had any sort of direct contact with. I mean, I've talked to uh, Don Murphy and Tom DeSanto, and I've spoken briefly with Lorenzo de Bonaventura, um, but so far that hasn't actually kind of become work on the movie itself I mean I'd love to be involved in some way I don't know whether that's going to happen or not but the interesting thing with the movie is there's a sort of knock-on effect that you know there's lots of peripheral activity happening around the movie you know there's games there's books there's a you know sort of a magazine you know all sorts of things are happening and you know I seem to be the go-to guy at the moment which is very pleasant to be and so the movie activity and it will only be more so as we get into 2007, is sort of generating lots of work for me. So at the moment, I'm flat out. I mean, would I like to be involved in the movie? Absolutely. But, you know, hey, if it's a franchise and we get to movie two, maybe it'll be down the line. Well, the little bits I've seen, I've seen some concept art, I've seen some design art, I've seen, you know, sort of a, a treatment, you know, on the script itself. And, you know, I think it sounds great. And, you know, I think it's, you know, I think just knowing what they can do with CG these days, it's going to look fantastic. I think that's a given. I think Michael Bay is a really good choice because he can do great action stuff. And, you know, I think a lot of this film will ride or fall on how good the action stuff is in it. And I'm pleasantly surprised. I went to see Mission Impossible 3 quite recently. And those are the, the writers of that are the writers on the Transformers movie. And, you know, Mission Impossible 3, I thought, was a fantastic adrenaline rush. So, you know, everything I sort of see heartens me more about the movie. And, you know, I really hope it does really well, and I, I can see no reason why not. You know, I just hope that the fans don't sort of just slavishly want it to be a kind of ad ad adaptation of the Generation 1 they know. I don't think it will be. I think it will very much be the movie Transformers. But I think, you know, within that, it's going to be absolutely fabulous. 